So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jerome Fisher. He's an assistant professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz, where he's been since 2007, where he started as a, as a postdoc coming from the University of Miami. And a major theme in his research is using advanced numerical modeling tools to uh, learn more about biogeochemical cycling and ecosystem processes. Uh, and he works with many different teams throughout the region on really collaborative interdisciplinary uh, projects, which I'm sure he'll be talking about today. So let's give him a, a warm welcome. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come give a talk and apologies about my voice. I've been losing it over the last couple of days, so hopefully it lasts for an hour. Um, you can see from the title of this seminar that it's, it's pretty broad and vague and that was on purpose because what I would like to do today is kind of a, give you an overview of recent and current projects that I've been working on that kind of focus on the overall theme of can we describe the spatial and temporal variability uh, in the environment, so in physical and biogeochemical processes that affect eventually higher trophic levels. And what I'll focus on today is uh, three specific examples. One is the low frequency variability in the sardine and anchovy population that has been documented for the California current region and other upwelling systems. So, you know, can we reproduce this and understand what are the mechanisms, the fundamental processes that lead to that low frequency variability? Uh, similarly, uh, sort of a more regional <coughs> ecosystem response is the foraging of California sea lions. So, uh, for example, here in 2004, which was more or less a normal year in terms of upwelling, sea lions, and this is satellite tracking of male sea lions, they tend to forage very coastally, very near shore, which is typical behavior for sea lions. But in 2005, when upwelling was delayed by a month or so, what happened is that the sea lions ended up foraging much further offshore than they would normally. So again, can we understand the fundamental physical and biogeochemical mechanism that would lead to a shift in foraging pattern that is you know, so significant? And then the last example I give <coughs> is the well-known connection between survival of coho salmon and abundance of zooplankton and then further the connection to the Pacific decadal oscillation. So when you have a warm phase of the PDO, you have decreased zooplankton concentration, and that leads to increased mortality or less survival of the coho salmon. Uh, just so we're all on the same page, and this might be you know, obvious to some of you, but I just wanted to cover it quickly. Um, the California current, obviously, it's an upwelling system, but it's also in important to realize that there's actually two types of upwelling. So there's what we would refer as a more traditional uh, coastal upwelling that's linked to Ekman transport. And this is the upwelling that, that you would see occur really close to shore. And then because of the structure of the wind field, you also have what's called curl driven of upwelling or Ekman pumping. And that's occur occurring over a broader region, a little bit further offshore, but it's also much weaker. So as an example, those are vertical velocity at the base of the mix layer from a model that we're running at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And th it shows that you can really clearly see that region of coastal upwelling with velocities about a meter per day, but that's a very narrow zone near the coast. And then this whole region here is where you would see the curl driven upwelling with velocities about an order of magnitude less, but happening over a broader area. Uh, <coughs> another aspect of upwelling that's important, it's related to the intensity of the coastal upwelling and the depth from which you're upwelling. So typically in the California current in this region, you would upwell from a depth of about 100 meter. But that depth happens to be at the steeper part of the mid decline. So even a small change in the depth of the source of the upwelled water, so 50 meters above or 50 meters below, could mean a decrease in nutrient concentration by about 50% or an increase by about 40%. So the overall <coughs> magnitude or intensity of the wind stress and the, uh, the forcing for upwelling 
can have a significant impact on how many nutrients or make it to the surface. And as you upwell potentially from deeper water, we also have the presence of the California undercurrent, which has typically a higher temperature, higher salinity, and lower dissolved oxygen. So you could potentially, if you're under very intense upwelling condition, upwelling from deeper and start drawing some of the undercurrent water uh, towards the surface. So those were for local regional forcing associated with the, the wind field. But um, the California current region is also impacted by remote forcing, and one of the main mechanism would be the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So typically the way um, ENSO variability affects the California current, it's either through atmospheric teleconnection, which have a lag of about a month. So what's happening in the tropical Pacific will affect what's happening in the California current about a month later through um, atmospheric teleconnection. And there is also a oceanic wind waveguide um, connection that has a slightly longer lag, about three months. So Kelvin waves are generated in the equatorial Pacific and they make their way to the California current region. And there's an interesting paper uh, by Frischnisch et al. a few years ago that says that the physical variability in the California current is primarily related to the oceanic waveguide, and then the biogeochemical variability is more closely related to the atmospheric teleconnection. And then uh, lastly, um, the other two type of remote forcing that are important in the California current is related to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and the North Pacific Gyro Oscillation. Uh, and those are low frequency responses of the ocean to atmospheric variability in the North Pacific. So the PVO is connected to the variability in the Aleutian Low and the Eastern Pacific El Nino. And then during positive phases of the PVO, the, the California current, is the productivity is generally reduced. The NPGO, on the other hand, is the low frequency re response to the North Pacific oscillation and the Central Pacific El Nino. And as opposed to the PDO during positive phases of the NPGO, then there's increased subsurface nutrient in the California current. So the big question now is, can we build a model that can predict this? So can we understand the spatial and temporal scales at which um, trophic levels aggregate to form ecosystem hotspots in the California current? Uh, well, we can certainly try. Uh, and so we've been uh, at UCSC running ocean circulation models for uh, about 10 or 15 years. Chris Edwards and Andy Moore were the first ones running those models, um, focusing mostly on the physical circulation. And so this is an example of the type of ocean models that we use. It's called the Regional Ocean Modeling Systems, or ROMS. Uh, it's a model that's very well suited to do regional circulation. It does well in coastal region. It can do with fairly complex topography. It's a community model, so it also has a lot of development that benefit all users. Uh, it's easy to do data simulation. Uh, you can do downscaling of climate models. Uh, one important one is you can do grid nesting, and that simply means that you can start from a lower resolution domain, so this is an example. So you could run the whole California current at 10 kilometer resolution, but we know that's not quite enough to pick up all the mesoscale and submesoscale variability in the nearshore region associated with the upwelling dynamics. So within that 10 kilometer model, you can actually have a three kilometer model that allows you to start picking up some of the finer structure of the upwelling filament. And so that's for the ocean circulation, but we're interested in the biogeochemistry and the ecosystem response. So what we do typically is we couple a biogeochemical model or NTZ type model, nutrient phytoplankton, zooplankton. And so this here shows um, chlorophyll concentration from running such model. And the model that we use uh, is called the NEMRO model. Uh, it's a model that was developed specifically for the North Pacific. It's kind of an intermediate complexity model. It has uh, three nutrients, silicate, nitri uh, nitrate, and ammonia, a couple of phytoplankton size classes, a small phytoplankton and diatoms, large phytoplankton. 
But what was important for us when we chose Nemro is that we're interested to connect this to the higher traffic level. So we actually wanted a fairly good resolution, not so much in the phytoplankton, but in the zooplankton uh, component, because those are eventually the prey of the forage fish and um, the connection to the higher trophic level. So Nemro has actually three zooplankton component, uh, microzooplankton, uh, mesozooplankton, which would be copepods mostly, and then a large uh, a predatory zooplankton, which would represent uh, euphosids or krill. And so this kind of came with, with the ROMS framework. Uh, and what we did is we created uh, a multi or developed a multi-species individual base model that would allow us to look at you know, the dynamics of forage fish in the California current, specifically sardine and anchovy, looked at juvenile salmon, and then we connected this to higher trophic level predators like sea lions and albacore. And we also included a fishing fleet, although we haven't done much with the fishing fleet so far. We're mostly interested in looking at the connection um, to, uh, to the higher trophic levels. So just a bit of uh, background, uh, if you're not familiar with individual base model, uh, it's typically a good way to look at higher trophic level organisms. And I mean, a, an individual is sort of the basic unit in nature. Uh, but one of the, the important uh, aspects or why you would want to use an individual base model is that because it allows actually to represent fairly complex life history and behavior, uh, which would be a lot more difficult to do in, in other uh, modeling frameworks. But essentially, our individual base model has two components. One is a bioenergetics component. So this is accounting for growth, starvation, reproduction, mortality. And there's different existing models that you can use to do this. The Wisconsin models, the dynamic energy budget models. So those are all tools that are already available. And we actually implemented both. We used the Wisconsin model for uh, sardine and anchovy, and then uh, DEB for salmon and sea lions. It turns out that behavior is actually the more complicated part. Uh, this, the bioenergetics can be fairly well constrained through lab experiment. The behavior, it's really hard to ask a fish or a sea lions what they were thinking when they were foraging. So you have to try different approaches on you know, how smart or how dumb you want your organisms to be in your model and how much do they know about the environment or how much you want to let them know about the environment. Uh, but so we, we, it turns out that uh, the type of behavior that's called kinesis, which is a happiness-based type behavior, is one of the, the behavior that's better able to represent the foraging of those uh, species without constraining too much their behavior. And essentially what's nice about kinesis, it only uses what the, um, the fish or the sea lion experiences at the moment and what it experienced in the day prior to make a decision on what it wants to do. So it, if it finds itself in a, in a good environment, then it'll keep doing what it's doing, but slow down a little bit. And then if it's in an environment that's unpleasant, then it'll start doing random searches for a better place. Uh, and, and one benefit of kinesis is that you can actually use multiple cues and combine them to uh, impose a response to environmental conditions. So uh, we've been using kinesis with uh, consumption and temperature responses, and that seems to be a good trade-off for a decision between finding uh, good environmental conditions. Uh, so <coughs> the rest of the talk is I'll show you example of how well such model uh, coupled ocean circulation, biogeochemistry, fish, marine mammals can predict the low frequency variability in sardine and anchovy population, shifts in foraging pattern for the California sea lion, and then the environment, environmentally mediated growth of juvenile salmon uh, as they enter the ocean. So obviously this is a very complex model with different, a lot of different components and moving parts. So whenever you run models like this, you have to be careful in understanding how well your model can reproduce different components of the ecosystem. Um, 
And the physical and biogeochemical variability obviously is an important part. Uh, and so this is always the first step we do. We take satellite observations, for example, and say how well does the model agree with satellite observations. So this is an example of the type of comparisons we would do. So here it's um, annual mean sea surface temperature from the model and from satellite data. So the spatial patterns look good. Then we look at the seasonality. So how well can we reproduce the seasonal cycle? And then sort of the low frequency or interannual variability. So this is tools that we have to evaluate how much we can trust the solution. Uh, and it turns out that for sea surface temperature, ROMS here in blue uh, does a nice job at reproducing the variability in red that you see in satellite observation. It actually turns out that you can also relate it to the forcing that would create that variability. And for sea surface temperature in the California current, uh, it seems like the variability in, is pretty much tied to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. We can do the same thing for the biogeochemistry. So one variable that's available from satellite is chlorophyll biomass. So this is a comparison of the model generated chlorophyll biomass versus uh, remote sensing uh, chlorophyll biomass. So again, the spatial pattern look okay. Uh, look at the seasonality. So then here we can see that the model is, tends to exaggerate the amplitude of the seasonal cycle in the chlorophyll. Uh, but then when you look at the intraannual low frequency variability, uh, the model in blue and the observation actually agree reasonably well. And, and we can also you know, make the connection to the potential forcing mechanism. And it turns out that the low frequency variability uh, in the model at least uh, for chlorophyll biomass relates to the North Pacific gyro oscillation. Uh, but because we run those models at fairly high resolution, so in this case, uh, 10 and 3 kilometer, we can actually start looking at the finer details of, say, chlorophyll concentration. So, for example, you know, you think about the California current as an upwelling system, there's strong alongshore winds, and you would expect the upwelling to be the same everywhere along the coast. But when you look at the model and when you look at the satellite data, it's actually not the case. So if you look at, so this is showing um, integrated chlorophyll concentration from the coast up to 50 kilometer offshore. And the model is in blue and sea waves is in green. And actually you see that the phytoplankton biomass response is far from uniform alongshore. And you actually get those two peaks of enhanced chlorophyll concentration uh, south of Cape Blanco and south of Point Arena. So why is that? And because the model can reproduce those peaks, then we can ask the model, wh why is it that we have those two peaks and not sort of a more uniform alongshore response? So we can start by looking at upwelling. So vertical velocities is typically something very difficult to measure in the ocean. But in the model, we have access to that variable. So we can see, well, if we assume that you know, the chlorophyll is driven by nutrients and nutrients is, are driven by upwelling. Let's look at the vertical velocity associated with the upwelling at the base of the mix layer. And what we see is that the vertical velocity, again, is very far from being uniform along the coast. And what we see is that we have regions of intense upwelling or stronger vertical velocities in the lee of the major capes along the coast. So south of Cape Blanco, you have a region of intensified upwelling south of Cape Mendocino, south of Point Arena, Point Reyes, Point Año Nuevo, Point Sur. So it seems like all those topographic features act to enhance upwelling in their lee. So, so that's good, uh, but that still doesn't explain the two peaks. Now we should have four or five peaks of chlorophyll. And the answer to why we only have two peaks, we find that in the surface currents or near surface currents. So it turns out that there's actually a really big difference in the nearshore or coastal circulation between Cape Mendocino and Point Arenas, for, for example. So if you look at um, Cape Mendocino, what's happening, and focus on the blue line here, which is the zonal component, so onshore, offshore component of the velocity. Near Cape Mendocino, the flow has actually a fairly strong offshore component, and you can see it in the surface velocity. So even though you're upwelling more nutrients 
in the lee of Cape Mendocino, those nutrients are not staying on the shelf. They're being exported offshore by the surface currents, which limits then the amount of production that you would get in that region. In contrast, for Point Reyes, um, the currents here are, has a stronger onshore component. So the upwell nutrients are then being retained on the shelf and lead to higher primary production. And this is what's happening near Arena is the same as Cape Blanco. And that's why Cape Blanco and Point Arena show up as those two peaks of chlorophyll concentration because it's a combination of intensified upwelling and retention of nutrients near shore by the surface current. So that's for the primary production. So it's good. I mean, we have some confidence that the model can pick up some of the finer details that are um, present in observed chlorophyll concentration. So what about the next step? So this is a project I'm working on with uh, Monique Messier and Francisco Chavez at Mbari and Jared Santora at UCSC. So can we predict trail hotspots? It turns out we're not doing too bad of a job at predicting trail hotspots. So those, this here is uh, estimated krill concentration from acoustics uh, during May-June. Uh, this is from the Carolyn Research Institute, and that represents uh, the period 2000 to 2016. And what you see from the krill observation or the acoustics is that you have those three distinct region of increased krill abundances, or you could call them hotspots. And the model, uh, so these are simulated krill concentration from May, June, and it looks like the model is also picking up those three regions as regions with enhanced krill concentration. But again, we have the model, so we can know more. Unfortunately, those observations are limited to May, June. So how are those three hotspots really representative of what's going on in terms of um, zooplankton concentration? And so it turns out that there's a fair amount of seasonality in the location and the intensity of those hotspots. So this is now from the model showing minimum and maximum uh, zooplankton concentration, or sorry, trail concentration in May, June, July, and August. And you see that this pattern of three hotspots is really representative of what's going on in June and May to some extent. But as you move uh, later in the season in July and August, the southern hotspot disappears. The hotspot near Mendocino kind of shifts to the north and then you end up with two broader hotspots. So I think this is where there's a lot of value in the modeling that we do is that it allows to put observation in the context of what's the overall seasonal and interannual variability. Uh, just like we need the observation in the first place to assess whether the model is doing the right thing or not. Um, and it turns out that if you look at the maximum krill concentration uh, in the, so this is again an average between the coast and 50 kilometer offshore. Uh, this is all model generated. So the red is krill concentration and the blue is uh, phytoplankton biomass. So there's actually those krill hotspots seem to correlate really well with some, a little bit of an alongshore spatial lag, but they, they correlate very well with the regions where you expect to have enhanced chlorophyll concentration or en enhanced um, phytoplankton biomass. And uh, this is just not spatially, but if you look at um, how those have phytoplankton and krill concentration on average vary in those three regions where we have hotspot near Point Conception in the Gulf of the Fairlawn and uh, south of Blanco, there's actually really high correlation between maximum chlorophyll and maximum krill in the model, uh, especially in the central and southern regions, so Gulf of the Fairlawn and uh, Point Conception correlation between the two are 0.9. Uh, so it seems like those hotspots sort of follow the seasonality in the chlorophyll concentration. How well does the model reproduce intraannual variability in krill concentration? Well, fortunately, we have nettos from the NOAA rockfish surveys that happens every year in May and June. Unfortunately, the nettos, uh, they go back to 1990, but um, they were just for the core region of the rockfish survey, which is the central California coast. Uh, but at least we can, we can see how well the model does against those um, krill estimates from nettos. Uh, 
And in terms of year-to-year -year variability, there is some correspondence between the model in red and the toes in blue, but there's also the model is not picking up every year correctly. So that could be a discrepancy or an issue with the model. It could also be that the net toes emphasized either high or low uh, krill concentration depending on the time of sampling and the place of sampling. But if you low pass filter those annual mean krill value both in the model and the net toes and you do a three year running mean, the model is actually picking up really well the low frequency variability in the observed krill concentration. And this seems to be sort of that six year periodicity in krill concentration superimposed to an increasing trend in krill concentrations over the last um, 20 years or so, at least the 1990 to 2010 period. Yes? Are the krill growing in the patch or are they attracted to the patch? Are they, are they in they real life or in the model? <laughs> Well, in the model, so they'll respond to, so in, in the model, we specify what they preferentially eat. So in the model, we specify they like diatoms. So they will be growing better in places where there's higher diatome concentration. So it's an in-situ growth in, the, in what you're calling the hot right. spots. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, well, it's, a, it's a balance between advection and growth. So because we have fairly strong alongshore currents, some of the nutrients in chlorophyll and krill get advected and they grow as they get advected. So it's really a combination of two, is the, the growth in response to prey abundance and being redistributed by ocean currents. Um, so low frequency variability seems to be doing okay. So uh, that allows us to see, well, how does that low frequency variability partition? Uh, and as a physical oceanographer, what we like to do is do EOF analysis. And we've extended EOF analysis to krill, and you'll see later we also extended EOF analysis to sea lions and anchovy and sardine. EOF analysis is simply a principal component analysis. So if you have a 2D time varying field, you do an EOF analysis, and you get the dominant spatial modes and how much to contribute to the variability and how the amplitude of that mode varies in time. Uh, so we did it simply here with the cross-shore average of krill concentration in the model. So we calculated EOF based on this, and what we end up is like different modes of variability and how those modes of variability vary in time. Uh, so first, uh, there's a trend. Uh, the trend is about 1% to 3% per year and it varies with latitude. So the trend seems to be larger in the southern part of the California current than the northern part. The first EOF mode, so the one that explains most of the variability in the krill concentration, is a synchronous alongshore response. So it can be either an increase in the intensity of the hotspot or a decrease depending on the sign of the amplitude of that mode. So when the amplitude is positive means all three hotspots increased in intensity. When it's negative, all three hotspots decreased in intensity. And it turns out that that first mode, the amplitude of that first mode, I didn't show it here, but it correlates fairly highly with the Pacific decadal oscillation. So it seems like at least in, in the first order synchronous response of the uh, krill hotspot intensity is uh, tied to the PDO. The second mode, I think, is, is really interesting because it shows an asynchronous response in the alongshore direction. So it favors either the southern hotspot with respect to the central and northern hotspots or vice versa. And um, you'll have to invite me again next year because I don't have an answer for what's creating that asynchronous response. And I've been looking at this for a couple of months now and I just can't quite understand what's creating it, but one day I will. And I'll come back and tell you about it. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's interesting because you know, it could potentially lead to a uh, north-south shift in higher trophic level species, depending on which of those hotspots is being favored. Uh, and why do we care about krill hotspots? Um, well, the obvious connection is to higher trophic levels and um, whales, um, humpback whales, blue whales, they feed on krill. Um, and also, uh, and although sea lions, for example, don't feed on krill directly, they probably feed on fish that feed on krill 
And if you look at uh, observed uh, marine mammal species richness from a bunch of different cruises, Kalkarfi, the rockfish cruises, they've identified those regions of enhanced sighting of marine mammals. And not all of them match what the model is saying, especially the one in the Southern California Bight. But if you look at um, the Central California coast and the region north of Point Conception that have l fairly large aggregation of marine mammals, those are the regions where we're predicting those uh, krill hotspots. So if we can predict those krill hotspots, then maybe we can say something about the distribution of marine mammals also uh, without actually having to model all the trophic levels in between. That takes us to the forage fish. So sardine and anchovy. Can we do sardine and anchovy? So we've established now that up to krill, we're probably doing okay with the model. So let's look at sardine and anchovy. Uh, so this is what the model predicts in terms of the long-term low frequency variability in sardine and anchovy population in the California current. So here uh, it's showing the annual mean spatial abundance. On the top is anchovy, the bottom is sardine. So as you would expect, um, you get the anchovy being more coastal or near shore distributed, and then the sardine being more of a transition zone or a more offshore distributed species. Also, I, I believe that the model is uh, exaggerating the offshore extent to uh, where you're finding sardine in higher abundances. So. I mean, this is kind of what we built in the model, so it was not a total surprise that we recovered it at the end because we set diets for sardine and anchovy so that the anchovy would feed on the larger diet of phytoplankton and, oh, and zooplankton species, so this would be closer to shore and then the sardine feeding on the smaller phytoplankton and zooplankton that are found further offshore. I think a more important question is can we get at the low frequency signal? So for anchovy, sometimes, sometimes not. It's uh, because the anchovy are more coastal, they, re they respond more strongly to variability in the pwelling. So, and I think that's sort of bringing up some of the flaws on the, of the model in how we parameterize their life cycle. So this is really a model that has a full life cycle for sardine and anchovy. So they go from egg to juvenile to adults, they reproduce back to egg. So and we have to parameterize that somehow. And, and because there's a lot more variability near shore because of the upwelling, then this might be exposing some of the shortcomings in the model and how we represent the life cycle. But you know, there are periods when it agrees. Um, if you look at um, catch data, um, this period here had lower abundances of anchovy and the model in black is also predicting lower abundances of anchovy, but there's also times where it's not agreeing. What's more interesting is what's going on with the sardine. So sardine, because they're further offshore, they have much more of a low frequency response to the environment. And it turns out that the model is actually doing a very nice job at picking up the period of low sardine abundances in the 70s and 80s, and then the ramping up in abundance and the period of higher abundances in the 2000s. So, so this was nice because this was not put in the model like we specified diet so we would get the right distribution. So being able to reproduce that low frequency variability was really an emergent property of the model. Uh, and, and it's nice because since we're able to reproduce this, then we can again ask the model, why, why did we get that signal? And, and so we did an EOF analysis again to try to understand what anomalies in sea surface temperature and in prey concentration were linked to years of high and low abundances of the two species. And so what we found is that for anchovy, uh, periods of higher anchovy abundance were linked to more intense upwelling uh, near Point Conception or in the central southern California current. The reason for this is because that um, intensified upwelling in this region led to higher abundances of zooplankton, which then led to higher growth of age one fish. So higher growth uh, led to more reproduction, so more egg being produced by those uh, age one and age two fish. And that's what led 
to higher abundances in the model for anchovies. So it seems like it's a local pattern tied to upwelling and tied to food abundance and then lead, led the link to adult growth and reproduction. It correlates to some extent with ENSO and the upwelling index, but the correlations are not very strong. I think because it's a very localized response. Now for, so, so it was interesting because what we ended up with is actually two different mechanisms affecting two different parts of the life cycle of those fish that led to uh, changes in abundance. So for anchovy it was reproduction and we found that for sardine it's actually survival during the early life stages. So what we found is that periods that were favorable for sardine in the model were a period with increased sea surface temperature in the whole region. And the reason for this is because there's a lot of mortality at the um, egg and yolk sac larvae stages and the development of those stages is a strong function of temperature. So if you have periods of or regionally warmer temperature, those life stages will happen faster and then there will be less mortality during those life stages, which then will lead to higher recruitment and eventually higher abundance. And that pattern of sea surface temperature that led to higher abundances in sardine um, in sardines is actually related again to the Pacific decadal oscillation. And I think an interesting part that you can do, so these are a little bit complicated to, to explain those changes in abundance uh, over time, but you can actually break those down again into components that explain most of the variability and that's again doing an EOF analysis on the temporal variation of the distribution of sardine and anchovy. And then what we can understand is that for anchovy, and again, that's another difference between how anchovy and sardine respond to the environment, is that the changes in abundance of anchovy that we see in times are mostly linked to changes in where the anchovies are uh, spatially. So a north-south shift in their distribution is what explain a lot of the variability in their temporal abundance. And then overall changes in biomass come second. Uh, whereas for sardine, the variability in time is primarily explained by changes in abundance. It explains about 64% of the variance. So it's that change from a low abundance period to a high abundance period, and then shifts um, meridional shifts in distribution explains about 16% of the variance in the temporal variability of sardine and anchovy. Um, and then we can push this even further and what if we were to do downscaling of a climate solution? So what would happen between 2000 and the end of the century? And we did that and for what it's worth, this is what this shows. And it shows that actually if you go uh, if you project it out to 2050, now for sardine, the dominant mode of variability temporally is actually explained by a north-south shift in the distribution, and then a change in abundance is now second. And anchovy still is a change in, in distribution. And this is what you would expect under warming uh, climate condition in the California current is that both species would shift their range uh, to the north. So this is a little bit out there, but it's actually part of the project I'm currently working on with the uh, NOAA folks in, in Monterey, Mike Jacobs and Stephen Bograd and Elliot Hazen. And we're gonna actually gonna try to do more rigorous downscaling of climate projection and see how those two species respond. All right, so that takes us to the sea lions. So are sea lions affected by the phytoplankton that affects the krill, that affects the sardine and the anchovy? Uh, this was a project with uh, Luis Hoxtet and Dan Costa at UCSC. And it turns out that, yeah, they are. So we can relate the feeding success and the foraging patterns of sea lions in the model to especially sardine because it's the most energetic prey for the sea lions. So they'll do well when they have access to sardine, at least in the model. And, and it turns out that what we found is that when sardines are closer to shore, 
and in higher abundance, sea lions end up foraging closer to shore and don't have to go out as often to find food. And so this is what, again, doing EOFs. So let me walk you through it. So this is the EOF mode that explains most of the variability in the sea lion foraging pattern. And so when it's blue and the amplitude is positive, so the red line here is positive and it's blue, it means that they spend less time foraging. So less sea lions went out and looked for food. And the opposite is true when the amplitude is negative, then they spend more time foraging and more time looking for food. And the, the amplitude of that mode for what I would call a feeding success uh, is highly correlated with the amplitude of this mode for sardines. So higher feeding success, less time spent foraging when sardines are closer to shore and in higher abundance. Uh, oh sorry, I mentioned say, and this, this mode is actually related again to the, the PDO. The second mode, and it was nice to see that second mode emerge from the model because it's what I was describing at the beginning of the talk, is that shift in nearshore versus offshore foraging of the sea lions. And, and again, this is what this EOF map shows here for <coughs> the sea lion foraging pattern, is that when the amplitude of the mode here in red is positive, it means that more sea lions were found offshore. So more sea lions were found in that red region, so more offshore and more to the north. And when the amplitude of the red mode is negative, then the sea lions just were closer to shore and didn't expand their foraging range as much. And it turns out that the temporal variability of this mode for the sea lion is also strongly correlated with an SST mode that describes coastal upwelling. So the link is here that during periods of <coughs> reduced upwelling, like the 97-98 El Nino, the delayed upwelling in 2005, the sea lions will end up foraging further offshore. So this is not a connection to the prey directly, but it seems in the model that it's a connection to the environment, the physical environment that they're experiencing. And so again, that mode is tied to the mode I was describing earlier for anchovy, where you have sort of either weaker or more intense upwelling in the central and southern California current region. So so what this shows is that we can actually build the model up to a top predator and understand how their feeding success and their foraging pattern can be affected both by the availability of their prey or different prey types and by a response to environmental condition in terms of the physical variability in the system. How well does that relate to real life? Well, we have tracking data as I showed on the first slide, so we can actually see um, how well the foraging pattern in the model compared to observed tracking data for the sea lions. And this is what this shows. So I uh, picked three years, uh, February 2004, five and six. So remember five was anomalous. The, don't worry about the color of the dots, but the dots that are not black in color show all the location where sea lions in the model forage. And the black dots show actual sea lion foraging from tracking data. So in 2004, except for one really confused sea lion, <laughs> uh, most of the sea lions, the real sea lions, forage very near shore. And in the model, it's similar. A lot of those dots are coastal or in the near shore region, especially when you compare it to what happened in 2005. So 2005, again, all the colored dots are foraging location from sea lions in the model, and the black dots are the track. And you see that all along the central California coast, the range of foraging location was extended offshore, both for the real animals and um, the modeled animals. And, and I added 2006 because I think that's an interesting case where the animal the animals extended their foraging range offshore north of Monterey Bay, but not south of Monterey Bay. 
and that I'm not exactly sure why, but it seems the model seems to be consistent with the observation of uh, the sea lion tracks. Uh, in this part, all the black dots tend to stay close to shore, whereas in this region, we have quite a few tracks going offshore, and the model predicts the same thing, but I'm not exactly sure why this pattern is, is emerging in 2006, whether it's just a combination of those two. Uh, and then, because the <coughs> satellite um, tags have temperature, they record the temperature that's experienced by the sea lions, we can also look at all those location where the animals foraged in the model and what temperature they experienced in the model and compare that with the tracking data. And so the red is the uh, temperature from the tags that were attached to the sea lions and the black is the temperatures that the model sea lions experienced. And it's again a really good correspondence and you see how anomalous 2005 or early 2005 was compared to um, 2003 and 2004. So it's nice to be able to tie it together and eventually relate it back to the, the sea lions in the model actually explored location that are consistent with the location where uh, the real animals were found. So that takes us to the last bit, uh, which is juvenile <coughs> salmon growth. And the reason I'm presenting this is because this is taking the model a little bit to its extreme because that's a very localized response. So this, the juvenile salmon, uh, those are Central Valley salmon that typically enter the ocean from the Golden Gate somewhere between April and June or July. And so what they're experiencing in the Gulf of the Fairlands or in that small region will really dictate how well they grow uh, in a given year. So we kind of wanted to do a proof of concept is that if we take from observations the three best years and the three worst years in terms of survival, can we relate this to growth conditions that in the model salmon would have experienced? And actually we can. And this is showing a typical pattern of, poten of growth potential for those juvenile salmon when they entered the ocean during what was a good survival year based on observation and what was a bad survival year. So more places where you have good growth potential and a lot better growth potential. And when you run it in the model and you calculate the growth of those um, salmon individuals in the model, the three good years show up really clearly in contrast to the three bad years in terms of how well the juvenile salmon were able to grow as they entered the ocean. And again, because the model was able to produce this pattern of good growth and bad growth related to good years and bad years, then we can interrogate the model and say, why was growth good for those years? And it turns out that those years are all had more intense upwelling earlier in the season. So if you look at um, the alongshore wind, they were not very different in most season between good years and bad years, except for March, April, May, where winds were much stronger during good years than bad years. And what that did is that it created more upwelling earlier in the season, which led to higher phytoplankton growth and then zooplankton or krill concentration lasting later into the year. And so the salmon were able to sustain growth for a longer period of time. And, and so this is how, uh, at least in a very simple way, uh, we could explain the connection between growth and survival is that it's that more intense upwelling earlier in the season that sustained growth longer uh, throughout the summer for the juvenile salmon as they entered the ocean. So as a summary slide, uh, we can try to put it together. So we have local regional forcing, we have remote forcing, we have a bunch of species. So what is the model telling us in terms of how those are all connected together? So let's start with the local or regional forcing. What the model suggests is when <coughs> it's that, um, it's that mode is primarily tiled to coastal upwelling variability, which is not surprising in the California current. But during cooler, more predictive year in the central and southern California current, 
uh, there is increased growth and population abundance of anchovy. But there is also a connection through sea surface temperature to an increase of either nearshore, offshore foraging of the sea lions in response to the, uh, the physical environment. And then sardine, on the other hand, tend to respond more closely to remote forcing. And by remote forcing, I mean um, positive SST anomalies that are related to the warm phase of the PDO. And again, because you have reduced mortality in the early life stages during warmer phases of the PDO, then you get an increased survival and higher nearshore abundance of sardine. Uh, during that time. And then that ties to <coughs> the sea lions. And so when sardines are more abundant near shore, then it increases the feeding success, at least in the model, for the sea lions. So that's the other connection. So now we find that through either the environment directly or their prey type, the sea lion foraging pattern and feeding success is connected both to the local regional forcing and to the remote sort of basin scale North Pacific forcing. And then the last link here is that the juvenile salmon respond to not unexpectedly to the local, very local forcing and an intensification of upwelling in early spring along central California tend to lead to increased growth during their first year at sea or right after uh, emigration into the ocean. So that's what we've learned from the model in a mechanistic way, if you will. And, and I think now, because we've established some of those connections and we evaluated the, them to you know, the best of our ability or to the availability of observations, then I think it'll be interesting to, to take it a little bit further. And this is work that uh, Brian Wells at the Southwest Fishery Centers and others has been doing is how does the overlap of different species then affect their uh, survival and mortality? And especially when anchovies are more abundant near shore during the period of migration of the juvenile salmon, the overlap of the two species could actually lead to increased mortality on the salmon sort of as incidental take by seabird that are foraging for anchovy or, you know. So, so I think now that we've built this model, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, perhaps study where we can see how the overlap of different species affect each other and then potentially affect uh, top predators. So this is uh, where I'll conclude. Um, and as a summary, this, <coughs> this modeling effort actually started as a simple proof of principle is can we do this? Can we build a model like this? Can we connect the physical environment to the biogeochemistry, to the forage fish, to the higher predator? And it turns out we can. And it actually provides us a mechanistic understanding of ecosystem variability across trophic levels. But it took also five, six, seven years to develop this model and to get it to the point where it's at because it's First, it's difficult to parameterize and calibrate, but also it's very difficult to evaluate because as I hopefully demonstrated, you need to go through all those steps where you understand that the variability that's predicted by the model actually agrees with reality. And so the, this is a challenging step, having to evaluate the physics, the biogeochemistry, the krill, the fish, the predator. But in all this effort, what we learn is that the most difficult part is actually the behavior and results tend to be more sensitive to behavior than any other uh, component of the model. The bioenergetics is actually not creating that much variability, uh, but behavior is a, is a challenge. And, and it's mostly incorporating enough behavior so that the animals, the organisms will respond to their environment without overtuning. So you don't want to put the answer in through behavior because then yeah, you'll get the right answers because you told the animal to do that. So this is really a fine line with behavior in terms of letting the animal respond and getting an emergent um, response as opposed to putting the answer in from the start. But uh, is it useful? So hopefully I've convinced you that it is somewhat useful. 
Um, and we've been able to uh, determine the impact of the wind forcing and the circulation on the alongshore uh, distribution of phytoplankton biomass. And we're starting to have some insight in the formation, the intensity of the persistence of trail hotspots in the California current. Uh, we were able to get at, at some of the environmental drivers that lead to uh, changes in population abundance in sardine and anchovy, especially sort of on the low frequency part of the, the response. Uh, we were able to connect the foraging pattern and foraging success of sea lions to their environment and the ability of their prey. And then sort of at the smaller scale uh, link the growth of juvenile salmon to their environment as they enter the ocean. So I'll conclude here and I'll take questions. <laughs> and actually I'll, I'll have a drink too because I'm losing my voice there. Uh, just a second. Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was something, that was the most thorough description of our ecosystem that I, I think I've ever sat through. It's upsetting almost, because I actually believe you know how it works. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, to some extent. Yeah. We're, we're, still, we're still dealing with the frankenfish. Is that okay? Yeah, just ask where you um, point <laughs> wind. 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 W was it driving the model? Well, so... Yeah. So the way those uh, circulation models work and affect the rest of the, the ecosystem is that we impose surface forcing. So it's wind, heat fluxes, um, soil irrigation. And then we impose, we have to also impose boundary condition because we're doing just a, a regional model. So we have to somehow prescribe the information that comes in into the region. And so typically we use either most most likely it's going to be coming from a global model. So we'll take solution from a global model, we impose that at the boundary, so that's how you would get the ENSO signal, the PDO signal. I, is, but it, is it what's driving the, the whole schlemiel here? Is it? It's, yes, it's a combination of both. I, I think the, the species that are more tied to coastal upwelling will respond to local forcing and wind intensity. Um, I think the the krill hotspots are probably driven uh, by wind and resulting ocean currents. The higher trophic level species, um, it gets a lot more complicated. Like the sardine and anchovy, we thought that you know they would kind of respond to the same thing. But then one species, because of where it is, the anchovy responded more directly to upwelling and growth with food availability. And at least in the model, Sardine responded more to an increase in survival during the early life stages, which was a region-wide response from remote forcing of the PDO. So it's really difficult. I think you, you have to go through this. You do know if anything there is <laughs> Well, uh, at, at least what the model is telling me. I'm sure it's slightly more complicated in real life, but. <laughs> There's a subtle thing you said that, that I've identified those hot spots, and there was a balance between the upwelling rate and the onshore, offshore, that, that seems like such a uh, fine balance because the upwelling rate is like uh, a few tens of centimeters per day and the velocity of those, on, how fast is an onshore, offshore current? Uh, well, so, I mean, I don't know if it's time to get back in the slide, but... Um. Yeah, so this, this actually, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of sorry I had to go through all those slides a little bit quickly without going into all the finer details, but um, this, I would actually refer you to the paper that we just published in GRL that describes um, uh, this in, in more details, but roughly the magnitude of the, the upwelling velocities are sort of the one to 10 meters per day. So, and that was the, um, those region of intensified upwelling. So for us, that was, was kind of an interesting discovery is that the topography seemed to really strongly focus upwelling. And then you get those regions of enhanced 
uh, falling velocities. And so in this case, it says you know, up to eight meters per day in terms of the vertical velocities. And they're really associated with the topography. And then when you get to <coughs> the surface currents, those are more strongly related to the upwelling jet uh, and sort of the alongshore meandering of the upwelling jet, the formation of filament, the you know, sort of quasi-steady meanders of the California current. But looking at the velocity, so this is in color the magnitude of the surface current. So it's about uh, 20 centimeters per second. So, so it, it kind of all, you, your point is that they're all on similar scales. Yeah. Between the vertical and the horizontal there. Yeah, obviously. But, but what's more interesting. The scale for the three spots. And it sets the scale and, and what you actually want to compare. And that's what one thing you can do in the model is compare the advection time scale to the growth time scale. So how quickly can the phytoplankton respond to upwelling? How quickly can the krill respond to phytoplankton? And then what does that mean in terms of being advected offshore or being retained near shore and leading to some of a higher concentration or a higher abundance? Yeah, it's, it's just, that's why it's so exciting is because there's not one simple answer. It's a combination of different mechanisms and getting at sort of the, a fundamental understanding of how those different mechanisms influence each other and, and eventually lead to an observed ecosystem response is, is kind of, it's quite exciting. I have a question. Um, uh, I was wondering whether you think your, your salmon part of the model could be used for, um, uh, for management. If you could use that, like for this year, if you could predict uh, the survival of the salmon and then, and then that could be used to predict how successful the returning salmon population would be? Yes and no. <coughs> the model works reasonably well in extreme conditions because the signal is so strong. So if you had an extremely good year or an extremely bad year, I think the model would help you predict this. But we also found that the growth potential is a much better predictor of survival during years where the conditions are poor. So when conditions are poor, your ability to grow will dictate your survival more or less. When conditions are good, so not super, super good like the extreme cases, but good enough, then predation becomes more of a driver of mortality and therefore survival. So, so I think it, it, the model could be applied, but it, I think it would have to be applied over a subset of environmental condition where we think that growth is probably the primary driver of survival as opposed to predation. Or we could include predation in the model, but uh, again, I'll come back in a few years. <laughs> Theoretically, compare it to the you know the stock of salmon that comes back. Yeah. Years later, how many years later it is? I mean, I, I think there are few models. I mean, it's kind of my personal view that are that are really able to inform management. And I mean, it, like the recruitment aspect, for example, is kind of the the holy grail and models like this are not designed to really be doing management on like what should be the quota, what is going to be the recruitment. But I think a model like this has a lot of value into understanding how different management practices impact the response. So you could, for example, look at different um, hatchery <coughs> management practices, release the salmon earlier, throw them longer in the hatchery before you release them, uh, toss them in the river, truck them to the ocean. So you could see, and, and I think that's where the value of the model is because you can very easily try those different scenario and do they have an effect on the growth of the juvenile salmon when they enter the ocean or not. And, and I think this is, to me, more, more important than like giving you one number of whether you know, how much of the salmon will survive and come back in three years. I think that number, I, it's important for management, but there's, there's so much more to that number in terms of understanding the variability around that number that I think this is where the value of a model is. So you'll, you'll know how much you can trust that number, essentially.
questions. So your model, your model, you were able to predict in the future how the Sabine will actually change you know, time. We're talking about 40, 50 years from now. But uh, considering these new changes in, in the, that we are detecting, like the 2014, 2015, blah, 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 how did your model predict that those, the distribution of financial gains have been in those years versus you know, these long-term uh, trends? And my second question is, what is the measure that you guys are using for uh, feeding success of survival? For feeding success of survival. OK, uh, so the first question, um, the real historical simulation where all those results are related to conveniently stopped in 2010, so I don't have to talk about the El Nino and the blob. <coughs> We're in the process of expanding it so we can actually see what happened. But, uh, and the, the climate downscaling is, it wouldn't have the blob at the time of the blob, and so it's more of a, you know, statistically you have the El Nino events and so on. So I, it, the, the climate downscaling was really, the reason I did it is actually I wanted to see if we could get periods where the two species would vary in phase because there's a lot of discussion that has happened that you know those species vary out of phase and that's because of the last hundred years of data when they varied out of phase. But in the longer record, there were times when they varied in phase. And because the model says that their dynamics is not driven by the same process, it's very, easy to imagine that we could actually have periods where they vary in phase. So that's why I did the climate projection, is we wanted to see if uh, uh, that, so, but that didn't have the blob. And, but I'm, I'm interested in the blob, obviously, because of the implication, and we'll eventually look at it. And I'm sure you had a second question, but I forgot what it was. Uh, what, is, what, is the, what measure did you use? After the, the, in the model, uh, we looked at uh, accumulation of so the, the bioenergetics model that we use for the sea lions, the dynamic energy budget, we can track how much fat the um, sea lions are able to accumulate. Yeah. So the years where they accumulated a lot of fat, we consider those were good years in terms of uh, feeding success. Sure, sure I'm just happy to stick around and answer some questions over some of you. Yeah. Happy hour. Well, okay. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs>